the main center of influence in our children's lives is their home. And it matters to us how we can help and encourage that process of you as parents discipling your children. So if you want to, text SURVEY to 623-623, SURVEY to 623-623, and that will open up a conversation about how you can best disciple, uh, disciple your child, uh, resources, and some other things are all available right there. That's SURVEY to 623-623. And now to get that uh, conversation started. <clears throat> Nobody uh, can monetize their game better than the NFL, the National Football League. They know how to make money off of everything they touch. Uh, they charge you for jerseys. They charge you for hats. Uh, they know which player is selling the most jerseys in what area and so those jerseys are spotlighted so it's not hard to find your hero's favorite jersey they've even managed to monetize the draft where they choose the players that will be part of their team uh, every year the teams get together and they have a day where they select people who will be on their team and this has become almost a cottage industry there are experts who will talk for months and months and months about who's going to be the first player to be picked in the NFL draft. What team needs to pick what player? And there's all kind of arguments going on depending on how the team did last year, what they're anticipating on doing this year, the kind of needs that they need to uh, fill and opportunities they have and all of that, who's in the draft, who's, who, who they can get this year, on and on and on and on and on and it happens. Finally, draft day comes and there's that big moment where your team takes the podium. As a 15th draft in this year's draft, the Tennessee Titans will choose and they'll name a player. The player will come across there, get a Titans hat, everybody hugs and shakes hands and poses for pictures and that kind of stuff. Half of, a, of the Titans fans are going, that's the best pick we've ever made. The other half are going, who is that guy? Why are we picking him? What's going on? Picking is, well, it's kind of a moment, isn't it? To pick, to be picked. You go from nobody to somebody in a matter of a moment simply because you were picked. You were chosen. Do you ever realize that you're picked? That you're chosen? That there was a moment when God himself stepped to the podium and the world got quiet and God said, with this pick, I pick and said your name. And the world went, what? <laughs> Why in the world would God pick them? That's an old question. It goes all the way back to Deuteronomy. Stand with me now as we pick up in this conversation. The Lord has his heart set on you. And chose you, not because you were the most numerous than all the peoples, for you were the fewest of all the people, but because the Lord, the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors. He brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the place of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps his gracious covenant loyalty for a thousand generations with those who love him and with those who keep his commands. But he directly pays back and destroys those who hate him. He will not hesitate to pay back directly the one who hates him. So keep the command and the statutes, the ordinances that I'm giving you on this day. For the Lord has his heart set on you and chose you. This is God's word for God's people. 
hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Help us understand the wondrous moment of being picked that we will leave this place and live as those who are chosen. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Let's remember the, the history of the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the fifth book uh, of the Bible. Uh, it's part of the Bible they call the Torah, the ancient law. Um, tells the origins of creation, the origins of Israel, and, and, and the story of Israel coming into the promised land. Now, there's an interesting um, story around Deuteronomy, in that if you have read the Bible all the way through, uh, a, a lot of us say, you know, January 1, I'm going to read the Bible all the way through. We do great in Genesis, we do great in Exodus. Uh, we start stumbling in Leviticus, Numbers buries us. But if you can get to Deuteronomy, it starts picking up again. Uh, one, when you start reading Deuteronomy, you start thinking, oh, wow, I have seen this before. Well, you have. Uh, a lot of Deuteronomy is simply a restatement of what you have seen in the first four books. In fact, one of the passages we'll talk about in the coming weeks is the, uh, a, another list of the Ten Commandments. Because some people think, that there was a priest in the time of King Josiah. Now remember, Assyria has faded off the scene. Their kingdom uh, empire has crumbled. Judah finds itself a free nation. Jerusalem is now an independent capital. And it hasn't been that way in years. And now they're trying to struggle with who they are as an independent country. They're thinking that a priest, to make the moment real, to, to really take advantage of this opportunity, recopied the high points of the first four books, stuck it in the ruins of the temple so that when the workers were rebuilding the temple and they turned over this particular stone, oh, we have found a new law. Deuteronomy means second law. And it's a rehash of what they have seen previously. It is a re-emphasis of, of stories and uh, points that have been made in the previous books. Now understand the moment. Israel, Judah, has been a slave of Assyria for generations. A lot of people in Jerusalem don't know how to live as a free people. They have always lived under the authority of Assyria. Jerusalem doesn't know how to run its country as a free people. They've always been a vassal state of Assyria. Now they have to figure out who they are as a free people. And the first question, the first question that Deuteronomy wants them to struggle with is who are you? Who are you? Who are you now that you're no longer a serious child? Who are you now that you are a free people? Who are you? The very first question that has to be answered is the question of identity. Who are you and who gets to say? Does that sound familiar? For we live in a culture that is now struggling with this very question. Who are you and who gets to say? Who are you and who gets to say? Sadly, our world leaves us hanging because it says, well, who you are depends on who you feel you are. Well, that's awful. Because I know just from my own emotions, that's not a very good answer to a question. Deuteronomy says, you are who you are because first you have been chosen. Is that how you would describe yourself? 
Is that the first thing that you would say for yourself? If somebody had walked up to you and said, now tell me who you are, would your first response be chosen? Picked. Every story of the Bible begins with God picking someone. Every story. We do not have one story where somebody says, you know, I had, a, I had an idea, so I went and told God. That story's not in there. The story is God found Abraham. God found Moses. God confronted Isaiah. Jesus calls Peter. Jesus calls the apostle Paul. And when you would push the Apostle Paul, why are you here? What gives you the right to preach to us? What gives you the right to write these letters and demand that we listen to you? How would Paul respond? I was chosen. I was chosen. Now, there's a lot going on about this being chosen and predestination and all of that. Let me explain it to you again. I tell you this story all the time, but honestly... A lot of our theologians would be much smarter people if they played basketball more. Okay, too much time in the library hurts everybody. They need to get to the gym and they can figure life out. <clears throat> now, you walk into the gym, a dozen or so guys hanging around, somebody says, hey, let's choose up, let's play. All right, let's go. The two athletes, the two best athletes are the captains. Everybody in the gym knows who they are. The captains are called out. You know who the best one is. You know whoever is on that guy's team is going to win. Your whole job now is to be chosen by that guy. That's your whole job. Now, now understand where you are. The captains are over there. You're over here with everybody else. Everybody else who is no good. <laughs> All right? Now, yeah, you know, you're over there with me. And, <laughs> and there's no argument over here. Nobody's saying I should be a captain. Nobody's saying, you know, I'm, I'm as good as he is. Nobody's saying that. They're all over here. Hey, we're no good. We know it. Captain chooses, and he chooses you. So you're standing there, and you hear, hey, Glenn, over here with me. Now, you're still the same sorry ball player you were. That hasn't changed. Nothing's changed. But you go from the losing group to the winning team. Now you're bad. Now you're bad. I knew who was choosing me. I knew him. I knew my job was to throw the ball back to him. I knew that's what my job was. <laughs> Nothing's changed except now I'm chosen. And as long as I'm on this guy's team, I'm going to win. You have been chosen. And as long as you are on Jesus' team, you're going to win. Picked, chosen. Who are you? You are chosen. Not because you were the most numerous nation in the world. You weren't. Not because you were the smartest, because you weren't. Paul reminds the Corinthians, let's remember who you were. None of you were the smartest people in the world. None, none of you were the strongest. But God has chosen the foolish to overcome the wise and the weak to overcome the strong. <laughs> Did you hear what he said? No, you didn't because you didn't chuckle. Okay? All right, get this. Why did God choose you? So when you come over here, you're going to find out God loves to play ball. See? See? And I'm going to pick those people. I'm going to pick those people that I can make better. 
who will let the world know how good I am at playing ball. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. And you're chosen to be on his team. Your first response is relax. Exhale. Why? Because some of you trying so hard to get Jesus to love you and he's already picked you. Relax. Some of you struggle all the time afraid that somehow you'll fall out of favor and God will change his mind. You are picked. You are chosen. That's settled. And you know, even in the gym, you can't unpick. Do you know that? Yeah, that's a rule. If you mess up and your captain says, I don't know why I picked you, the other people will say, huh, tough now, you picked him. He's on your team now. You pick. You can't unpick. Jesus is never going to be in place where he looks at you and says, I don't know why I picked you. There's always going to be in a place where he continues to work in you and through you so that you'll know how good he is. Chosen. Now, a lot of people want to spend a lot of time reading that. Well, he'll bless you to the thousandth generation and he'll cause pain for the, on, on all of that stuff. Listen, you have the opportunity to choose after you're chosen. Jesus calls Peter. Peter drops the net of his father's fishing boat and follows Jesus. Jesus calls Matthew. Matthew leaves his tax. You have that choice. If you follow Christ, there is blessing. If you don't, one of the things that makes hell, hell, is that you chose it. This is what you wanted. You didn't want what God offered you. You wanted what you wanted. And now this is where you are. You got what you wanted. And it's not what you wanted at all. But it's what you insisted on. And God let you have it. And now you think you're being punished to the thousandth generation. That's how intense the suffering of hell is. You think you're hurting so bad that your children will feel the pain. All because you didn't want to be chosen. You didn't want to be picked. You wanted to play the game all by yourself. And now you get slaughtered. And now you want to blame God because you refused his goodness. Now, don't get cocky because you're chosen. There's a responsibility that comes with being picked. What does it mean now in the way that you treat each other because God picked you? What does it mean how you treat your life because God picked you? What does it mean, like the NFL, when you are chosen and all of a sudden you put on that team's uniform? What does it mean now that you've been picked? If you're on God's team, you play the game God's way. You're picked. chosen. Same way Jesus called to Peter, he now calls for you. 
The same way that he called Paul, he now calls you. The same way that he called Abraham and Moses, the same way every story begins, your story now begins as well. You are being picked. Now, would you choose to be chosen? Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just thinking about your life in this moment. Everything you've done, everything before this moment is now gone because you've been picked. Everything ahead will be new because you've been picked. And I know I'm saying a whole lot in just a handful of words. Our ministers will be waiting for you at the Welcome Center. We'd love to have the chance to continue this conversation, talk with you further about what it means to be picked. Perhaps you'd like to know more about our church. You come. We're waiting on you. However, you now need to respond to the call of Christ, the love of Christ in your life. He's waiting for you where you are. The church will wait for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open before you, every heart. So we pray now that the choices and decisions we make are exactly what you want.